So in, in 2003, Martin Eberhard and I started Tesla. And that was because no one would ever have invited us to run a company, <laughs> I mean, after, after that. Uh, so when we did that, we had a mission. And the mission was to reduce oil consumption. And this talk is going to be about how you think about your product when you can't iterate like crazy. Because with cars, you really can't do that. So when we looked at this, we said, you know, we're going to do it through cars. And we first made sure that, in fact, cars actually used oil, I mean, in a, in a big way. I mean, you know, we did research. The trick is you've got to research everything. So it turns out almost all the usage is, in fact, uh, from cars. So how many people have seen product, you know, sort of mission to product charts like this? Yeah, most of you, right? Uh, this does not work for all products. Uh, and in fact, I actually Googled this because I thought, well, maybe, you know, when we did this in 2003, uh, you know, management's come a long way, technology's come a long way. Maybe there is, in fact, some way to really iterate in a, in a great way with this. So I looked this up on the web, and I found this. This, uh, this is actually on the web. You can Google this. So this was, you know, like car MVP. And, and, and I, I assume, I hope, at least, I'm taking this somewhat out of context. Because you know, if you had this idea of car, and then your MVP is somewhere between a bicycle and a motorcycle, and you'll iterate on that and end up in a car, like, that is not going to happen. I mean, it's just, you can't, you can't do that with cars. Uh, this is the MVP of, for a car company. Like, there, you have to make a car. You can't, you can't do something else. And I, 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 do, I really want to go and figure out this, because it isn't. So when you can't iterate like crazy, you have to do a lot of research and make a lot of assumptions, which may or may not may be right. And one of the big things we had is we had an intuition that battery electric was going to be best. That for our goal, remember, our mission is to reduce oil consumption. So how do we do that? And we thought that battery electric was really going to be the best for a lot of reasons. But we weren't really sure. And what we really didn't want to have happen is to be five years into this process and discover, oh, shoot, we should have used something else. And we get crushed by competition. So hydrogen fuel cells were all the rage at the time. And in fact, in the, as we were raising money, this was the single most common question that we would get asked. You know, why aren't you using hydrogen fuel cells? And they're very seductive. You know, you have hydrogen in, you go through the fuel cell, and you get and you get uh, electricity out. The problem is, where does the hydrogen come from? Now, we would be told, it's like, well, what do you mean? Hydrogen is the most abundant element in the universe. Well, that's true. It's abundant out there in the universe. But we live on a planet. And, and on a planet, the hydrogen is bound up into everything around us. It's bound up into the water. It's bound up into this device. Hydrogen is super reactive. That's why it's so great in a fuel cell. There are no hydrogen mines. It, it, uh, it, you, know, you have to actually make it. And you make it typically by putting energy in. So you, know, you put it, it, the most common thing, I think everyone here has probably done electrolysis, where you, you, know, you took the electricity and you stick it in the water, right? That's a very common way to do it, a very efficient, actually, way of doing it. So you have water, but you've got to have electricity. It's energy in, water, hydrogen out, um, and then through the fuel cell to make electricity again. So hydrogen is just an energy carrier. It's a storage device for energy. So when people talk about the hydrogen economy and stuff, it's just bullshit. Like, it doesn't, because it's like the wire economy. Well, you know, we have wires that carry energy really well, and maybe hydrogen's, you know, an okay carrier, but it's not a fuel, because you have to make it. So we had to make really, really sure that all these VCs that were telling us, why aren't you using hydrogen, we had the answer for. So we looked at, it's like, how far can you drive? Maybe hydrogen really is the answer. So you take that electricity, and it doesn't matter where you get the electricity, whether it's from the old world or the new world, it's still energy in it. You want to re use every resource you can at the, as the, the best you can, because that's your competitive advantage, ultimately. If your inputs are super inefficient, that's going to be really expensive in the end. So we figured, well, how far can you actually drive? It turns out hydrogen is a terrible energy carrier. You have to make it. You have to compress it. We tried to figure out how to distribute it. And that was so complicated. And so hydrogen doesn't move well through pipes or anything. Uh, it moves great, actually. It moves so well, it gets inside the steel and destroys the pipes. <laughs> so it's a little molecule. It's like this really tiny molecule. Uh, 
so it's a terrible, terrible uh, thing. So it turns out that if you, everything is at the theoretical most efficient and you don't distribute it, it you somehow make it you know, right there in your garage, which is another thing that is not a great idea, frankly, uh, it's about 20% efficient. And in actuality, it's about 8% right now. And maybe they can get to 10% someday. But we also knew that if you took that same amount of energy and simply charged up the lithium ion batteries in your laptop and used those lithium ion batteries uh, to, to power an electric motor with no new technology, this is all off the shelf stuff, this isn't some theoretical max, that that's almost, you know, it's in the 80% efficiency. There isn't gonna be something else that's gonna come at us that's twice as efficient. You know, there's just no way, there's not that much margin. So we figured that that was safe. And we, some of the VCs we'd tell this to and they'd get real quiet. And they'd be like, they'd look at each other and like, oh, shoot, you know, we invested millions into it. <laughs> like, oh yeah, well, you shouldn't have done that. Um, <laughs> so another thing that was real big was ethanol. And ethanol also is kind of compelling. Uh, and you know, you take this biomass, and there's lots of you know sources of this biomass, and you convert it into ethanol, and you drive your car with ethanol. And you know, we thought, okay, well that may be that that may work. Uh, and there's a question about how much biomass there really is around, and what the efficiency is. And there was a lot of startups at the time uh, doing biomass conversion, and the most interesting ones used this fancy enzymatic thing, and they thought they could get about 2,200 miles of biomass. And we were beavering away on that calculation, trying to understand. Did that actually make sense? Could we actually, you know, could they really get 2,200 miles per ton of biomass? And, and then Martin, my co-founder, said, you know, what if we just took that same biomass and just burned it in a GE, you know, combined cycle generator, something off the shelf? How far would that go? And it turns out if we just burn the stuff, it, you know, we can go a lot further. So we thought, again, no matter what they do, whatever their particular strategy is, we can say, hey, just take all your inputs, get rid of your company, and just burn the stuff. It's better. It takes it further. So we knew competition wasn't going to come from there. Uh, there was also, you may have remembered Bush the second, Bush the second. Uh, he was super into this thing called uh, switchgrass. Oh, no, I'm sorry. This is corn. This is even better. So we're the only country on Earth that uses corn for fuel. There is a reason for that. Um, it's because it makes no sense. Uh, <laughs> So the, as it turns out, the, the, you get, if, if it's energy positive, and there's lots of people that say it's not energy positive, that it's actually energy negative, but if it is, if you listen to the proponents and it is energy positive, you get about 2,100 miles per acre, something about that. Um, and we thought, well, the farmers in the Midwest who are in politically important states that get the subsidy, they're, you know, they're really, really good at growing corn. So maybe they're just going to grow our, you know, maybe the proponents are right, it really is 2,100 miles, and we can just grow our way out of, out of uh, energy dependence, or, or uh, in this case, uh, fuel or oil. So we figured, well, how much land would it take? So this is all the arable land, and not, obviously it's not in a big square in the center of the country, but you know, this is kind of as much as you get. Uh, if you planted all of it in corn, you could offset half the driving, assuming that it's energy positive. But we'd have to import 100% of our food. And you know, we knew that politically that just wasn't going to happen, right? So that's, that's done. This was the one that Vinod was really into, Vinod Kosla, Kosla Ventures. We were on a bunch of panels with him later about this. He was into this switchgrass, which, which uh, uh, George Bush would, would talk about. He had you know, plants growing like that behind him and stuff at, in, in the, uh, at his presentations. But you could get maybe about you know, 46,000 miles if this stuff actually worked. Now, it turns out. It, they never got anywhere in its efficiency, but that was kind of the belief. But you know, if you simply took that same acre of land and put existing photovoltaics on, that has so much more energy. You can drive cars you know, so much further. There was really no competition there either. Uh, and we still thought, well, maybe you could grow enough switchgrass. Well, that's, you'd have to take out like, you know, a quarter of all of our farmland. Um, but that's how much it would be for PVs to take half of all the driving in America. And of course, you wouldn't put it in the farmlands, you'd put it out in the deserts. So there's really no comparison on any resource we looked at. The, the battery electric thing was going to be the best. And we wouldn't lose you know, by some weird competition coming at us. And of course, we know how to do that. And battery electric you know, can come from solar panels. And most interestingly, this was what I found to be one of the most uh, compelling shots in our research 
was that this is what it takes to never use any fossil fuels in your life. If you live in a Mediterranean climate like we do, it's about a three kilowatts on your roof. Uh, that's 14,000 miles of driving, which is the state average. And you'd never, you'd be energy neutral for all of your driving. That just didn't seem that hard. Now, it turns out actually building the cars was a lot harder than that. But the, <laughs> so the next thing that we did is we really looked at the total addressable market. And you know, there's a gazillion cars are sold. They're super expensive. There's you know, an enormous, enormous market. This was the problem, though, is that in 2003, there were no electric cars being sold. The market, there were some on the market, but they were not being sold. No one was buying them. So we looked really carefully at that to try to understand what was wrong with those products that we could make our product better. And these, <laughs> these are all ones. In fact, Zap was down here uh, in San Carlos or Redwood City or something. Uh, these are the kinds of cars that were available if you wanted to get into the electric car world. Uh, and uh, you know, many of these, uh, well, nobody was buying any of them, right? Uh, this, this was actually the Stanford Mall. I saw one of these, it was great. Uh, it was on display, of course, nobody had bought one. Uh, <laughs> And, and for many reasons, a lot of people like this one. I don't know why. So any ideas on why these were not being successful? <laughs> Ugly design. Slow. Slow, yeah. Yeah, they just sucked, right? They were just <laughs> terrible, terrible products. Um, the product marketing departments didn't exist in those companies. I don't know. Martin called them punishment cars. <laughs> they, they were designed by people who hated the idea of personal trans, or hated the idea of driving. You know, you were supposed to be riding your bicycle or walking or taking public transit. And if you had to drive, you needed to be punished for it. And you'd be put in one of those things. And people would see you in one of those things. And you'd be, so, so that was not, you know, we knew that those products weren't where we wanted to be. We looked at EVs of the past. Now, many of you probably don't realize, but in the 1800s, electric cars and gasoline cars were about even. Uh, and it was actually steam-powered cars, too, and they, they faded out pretty quickly. The, and these, these are delightful. We actually named all of our conference rooms after failed electric car companies, <laughs> uh, just to kind of keep us in, you know, in, in, in mind. Uh, but these were for ladies that lunched, was actually the, 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 if you look at your target market segment, that's actually a target market segment, ladies who lunch, which I thought was great. Uh, or actually, ladies who take luncheon, I think is the way it was said in the 1800s. Um, but it was because, and then what killed these actually was the electric starter. Uh, that that uh, to start a gasoline powered car at the time uh, was extremely hard and dangerous. And it, you had to be kind of an able bodied, you know, strong person to do that. And the ladies who lunched did not, not do that. Uh, but they could get into their electric car and just drive away. But then the electric starter came and it, it killed these. There were some other cars that had been sold. So, you know, the zero emissions mandate when California could still do its own thing. Uh, we had the zero emissions mandate, which forced all the car companies to make electric cars, essentially, zero emission cars. And the car companies did what you would expect in that they spent lots and lots of resources super focused on this problem in Sacramento. And they got the politicians to rewrite the mandate and get rid of it. Uh, and they all, the day that that happened, every single one of these cars was off the market. And they were all leased. So no, no one actually owned these cars. So they canceled all the leases and took the cars back. There were two of those cars. They were actually pretty decent. The, the EV1, which there was a movie about, uh, and the Toyota RAV4. And there's still some Toyota RAV4s around. I see them occasionally, the originals. Toyota, well, so GM did something which, again, as a marketing person, you got to really think about. So they took back these leases from people who love these cars, and they crushed them in front of them. If you have a product that people really love, do not take it back and crush it in front of them. <laughs> they will just despise you forever. Uh, but that was, they were, because we, most of these people actually ended up being our customers at, you know, at Tesla. Toyota, different company. And Toyota's RAV4 was good simply because Toyota doesn't do anything half-assed. Like they just wouldn't produce anything that wasn't great. So, so they just said, oh, you like our product? Great. You know, buy out the lease, it's yours. And that's what they should have done. But GM, no, crush them, you gotta do that. But they did say that there was really no market for them. There just wasn't enough interest. Tree huggers and geeks were the only people that were interested in them. 
So we really came to this and said, it wasn't sort of who killed the electric car, which was what the movie was about, which came out later. But it was really these things about limited range, you know, terrible performance, uh, you know, it's terrible styling. Those were all the things that killed the electric car the first time. So we looked at that and said, you know, what kind of product can we actually make? And you know, we used basically spreadsheets and high school math. And I give a, a talk like this to high school students. And I say, you can actually design cars in Excel. It's a little weird, but you can actually do it. You can certainly find out what kind of car you could make. And what we learned through this process was that electric cars can do some really, really neat things. For one thing, they're super fast. They can out-accelerate any internal combustion engine car that you can make. And in fact, all the supercars now, these million-dollar Bugattis and stuff, they all have at least electric assist because the only way you can get that acceleration is by electric. It turns out that the physics just favors that. Uh, Lithium-ion batteries, which were really getting good at the time, were getting better and cheaper and better and cheaper. We had, been, you know, had lots of consumer electronic experience around that. And we thought about what kind of car could we really make, because it's got to be a better product. So we looked at what that product, what would excel in that product. High performance, we'd make the range super long so people didn't have to worry about you know, range anxiety, uh, which was something that Leaf screwed up about. They made the, the Leaf have a, you know, like an 80 mile range, so you're always nervous and you never know when you're gonna get, get a charge. If you make the range a few hundred miles, then you, know, you wake up in the morning, you have a full tank, you don't have to worry about it. They're super cheap to drive. And this, I think, is what derailed the previous products. Because they're so efficient, every mile that you drive hardly costs anything. So they were marketed for cheapskates, people who really wanted to save money. Uh, but that's not who buys cars. We don't buy cars to be cheap, because otherwise we'd all be driving you know, some super cheap car. Instead, as soon as we get a little bit of extra money, we tend to buy a better, bigger, fancier, you know, faster car, whatever, even though we're stuck in exactly the same traffic. You know, that Ferrari does not get you to work twice as fast. Um, you're stuck, you're going 30 miles an hour on 280. They also happen to have no maintenance costs, which is a really interesting thing about the car industry right now. And one of the, I think, the biggest transformations that's going to happen actually in the electric world is that the car dealerships, um, they're, almost all of their revenue is based, on, or almost all their profit is based on car maintenance. And electric cars don't have any maintenance. They have no oil. They don't, they don't have antifreeze. They don't have belts and spin things that go up and down. I mean, like all that stuff, this timing belt, none of that stuff exists. They're mechanically super simple. And they never come in for maintenance. So it's going to be really interesting to see how that plays out. So we thought, sexy product. Sexy product sell, and we'll make it super quick. And at that time in 2003, the very fastest sports cars were about 0 to 60 in four seconds. So we thought, we'll just be as fast as the fastest sports car. So we'll actually be cheaper than anything else of comparable speed or quickness. Great. But we still have that problem with that bicycle. We can afford to do the bicycle. We can't really figure out how to make the car. We thought of the Roadster, and many of you may have been familiar with the, the original Tesla Roadster, as our MVP. What we would do is we would only spend money developing the technology that we cared about, the thing that made the car go. Because everything else about the product was stuff that other people had done before. People have been making cars for over 100 years. They know how to do that. So we're not going to add value there, at least not initially. But we're going to add value where we make the car go. We'd find existing chassis. We would do all kinds of stuff to make all the other stuff as off the shelf as possible. So the basic idea is that we would build the drivetrain, that we would partner with somebody to screw the car together, and more importantly, get us access to the parts bins that these car companies use. That's like the, you know, who makes the windshield wiper blades and everything else. You have to have that relationship. And then we would put a Tesla hat on it. And in the car industry, a hat is you have a platform that's the same everywhere. And you put these different hats on it to make different cars. So in fact, these two Nissans are the same car. This minivan and this little, this little um, hatchback, they're exactly the same car underneath, but those are different hats. So we thought, great. Uh, we also had to come up with all the, other, you know, the standard stuff you do with product development, with how to charge it and maintain it and all the other stuff. And then we raised money, and this is where we ran into Elon. He was uh, one of our investors in Series A. He led Series A as an angel. He was building spaceships. 
So it was a great sell to him. It's like, you know, these are cars. He's like, oh, easy. You know, I'm building rocket ships. <laughs> A lot of VCs don't think that way, but he was not a VC because he was, he was off doing something. Uh, and then we built this mule. So this was our sort of MVP, if you will. We weren't going to ever let a person buy it, but this was a Lotus Elise. That was our you know, manufacturing partner. We put in, this is us dropping in our battery system into it for the first time. And we screwed it together. Uh, we got a stylist to look, figure out the hat. His name is Barney Hat, oddly. <laughs> That's the, the designer, but, but he really was designing the hat for it. Uh, and we then drove it for the first time uh, right before a board meeting. And it was magical, and it was super quick, and it was you know, kind of what we had expected, um, sort of. We raised a whole bunch of money, because you have something to show. Investors don't have a lot of imagination. You show this thing, they're like, ooh. And Elon was super into it. Uh, and we brought in Valor Equity Partners, which was another, it's a big VC firm. But it wasn't good enough. So our little MVP there, we were able to play with it and show it to lots of people. And we're in stealth mode, right? So it's just you know small, small time. But nothing was good. It was based on a Lotus chassis, which you know for a $30,000 sports car was fine. But this was going to be more like a $75,000 sports car. And it just wasn't good enough. And we got all kinds of feedback on doors and, and heating systems, which have to be different for electric cars, because they don't generate any waste heat. You have to, to make that. And we knew that. So we had like a dozen different things that we thought we weren't going to have to do. So remember I said we were only going to do the drivetrain. And you know everything else we were going to get off the shelf. Well, that didn't work at all. We were supposed to original, our original design had us supplying basically three or four big subsystems or big components to, to Lotus for assembly. And we ended up, in the end, about 400 different components we were supplying because our MVP wasn't good enough. So we had all these changes. And that required board decisions because suddenly it wasn't going to cost us the millions we thought. It's going to cost us a lot more, and it's going to take longer. And the board was uh, pushing for it as well, Elon particularly. He was like, you know, you only get to release your product once. In this particular world, we can't iterate. So it has to be as good as we can get. So we did it in clay, which is where the artists sit there and work in clay. This is clay wrapped in, in uh, mylar to see the reflectivity of it. We signed off on the final design. We did all kinds of testing, uh, aerodynamic stuff to tweak it in. Uh, figured out our motors, working on that. And in April, we put pencils down and we're done with the design. So we built 10 of them. So this is like another kind of MVP. But again, these are not for sale. These are just you know, to, to test out. And they were beautiful and gorgeous. And it was so exciting. So we immediately raised money. <laughs> and this time, you know, it was a lot easier because people would get them, oh, this is like perfect. Uh, we showed it around. We came out of stealth mode. And people got to see our product for the first time. Schwarzenegger was at our party, our coming out party. He's really big, um, big this way. I, I was worried he wasn't going to fit, actually, but it turns out he's fine. Uh, and we tested and tested and tested these 10 prototypes that we made. We crashed some. There's a crash test thing you have to do. We destroyed those. You, know, you spent hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars making them, and then you spent hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars crashing them into walls. But you get this super cool video of it. Uh, <laughs> It's, it's, like, it's HD, and it's you know, like 1,000 frames a second. It's really neat. Uh, but we tested it like crazy, uh, uh, including on durability tracks. These are standardized all over the world. Uh, they're incredibly brutal, 100,000 miles of wear and tear in your car in like three months. It's so difficult that the, the drivers have to be rotated all the time because they'll have kidney damage from the, the seriously, I mean, it's like craziness. Uh, it sounds great. You know, oh, come drive exotic cars. <laughs> Only you'll get kidney damage. You know, like it's not so great. <laughs> Test driving on frozen, you know, again, standardized test tracks all over the world. This is a frozen lake in Sweden. Thousands of design changes, literally thousands from this process, went back into our next iteration of 10. And this is our validation prototype. So now we actually knew what we were going to be building. And so now we, we screw that together. They were super gorgeous. And so we immediately raised money. And this time we had lots of money. And it was, it was much easier to, to do. Lots of VCs wanted in. Because you know, the, the great thing about VCs is that they all have sports cars. So you could, and they're like, oh. it's, it, was, it was great. Uh, that was one of the great things, too. And you're raising money. And, and they would say, well, when will this pay for itself? 
and you could say, what kind of sports car do you have? And they go, oh, I've got a Maserati. Blah, blah, blah. And you'd go, when does it pay for itself? They go, oh, I never thought of that. Um, so, so building factories and stuff. And then we had this transmission problem, which nearly sank the company. And this is where the CEO gets wiped out. So Martin it was CEO this whole time, and he gets wiped out because of a variety of reasons, but this particular our transmission, which was a disaster, which was an off-the-shelf part, effectively, that we were buying. But it didn't quite work right, and it was you know, terrible. We had an interim CEO come in, uh, which is you know, a whole separate thing. Interim CEOs only come in when like, it's a disaster, right? So Michael Marks came in, and he was great, but he had his own thing he was going to go do. And he's like, oh, no, I only do disasters for a few months you know, in the summer. And, and he was great. You know, he, was great. <laughs> he was totally great. But you know, like, he's like, oh, yeah, it's, it's, I'm not. Um, he was a customer, though, which was how he knew him. Uh, the car was working great, except we couldn't ship it because the transmissions were a disaster. So we're kind of running out of money. Uh, and then we got our permanent CEO. And this is Zev Drory who was the CEO of Monolithic Memories, um, who I don't think had also done his research as well as a man, like just very much like a man had said, hadn't really done his research on what he was getting into. And he wasn't a particularly good fit, I didn't think. The board loved him for a few weeks. Uh, <laughs> so January comes along. We have all these people. We're burning through money like crazy. Everything is working except the car. Like we've got, we have, we have all the approvals in place. Everything's done. Um, except we can't get the car to move because the transmissions are still screwed up. Uh, so we finally, you know, we're, we have a plan, though, to fix that. We have an expensive bridge around. 2008, not exactly the greatest time to go out raising lots of money. Uh, but by June, we were delivering cars. And this is the important thing, is that at the end of that process, because of all of those thousands of design changes that we had made with our kind of funny sort of MVP, uh, the customers were delighted. And you know, they, they really, really love the car. They still love the cars. I see them all the time. I get stopped in the street sometimes and say, oh, I met you at that weird party that you guys hosted when you weren't shipping any cars. You know, I just love my, my Roadster still. Uh, and, and then in October, uh, the board had lost faith with uh, Zev or whatever he, whatever the words were. Anyway, Elon takes over. <laughs> and, and that was a great move because Elon had been an incredibly supportive investor. So, you know, the previous speaker talked about knowing your board and, and knowing you know, your investors. And Elon had been a believer in the mission from the very beginning. And that was you know, super important. He had supported the company all along, and he's been great, obviously, taking it over. He's a little bit erratic, maybe, but he's been great in this particular context. Um, and then, of course, we announced the sedan. Well, this time I had left, but we, the sedan was everything that we had learned from the Roadster. So this is sort of, if you will, the MVP of, of the next iteration was the sedan. Uh, and I'm going to leave you with just one thought about product and why product is so important. You never actually know how your customers are going to use your product. You want them to love the product and, and really fall in love with the company as a result. But you never know exactly what's going to happen. So Elon loved his Roadsters. Uh, and he, you know, he loved the company. And he took that Roadster and he mounted it inside of a rocket and he blasted it into orbit uh, and then sent it off to Mars. So I just want to leave you with this thought about your customers will do the craziest things you can, you know, <laughs> but you want your product to look great and to work really well for whatever they're doing. Anyway, thank you. <laughs>